presentation. Yes, I'm uh, currently a uh, DevOps engineering lead with software based uh, in our Bulgarian office. Been with the company for maybe a year and a half now. And um, what I wanted to show you today is a case study around the project we are working on over the past few months. It's been a really interesting project. And uh, I won't be able to dig into much details because uh, uh, most of the details are really proprietary and we are behind a non disclosure agreement with our client. But uh, I think it will make a very good high level architecture overview of the approaches and decisions we took over the past maybe more than a year now. And we'll show you where we are, where we started, where we were, and where we are now. And hopefully this is going to be interesting to you. Now, while I'm uh, doing my presentation, I'm going to stop my camera to save on some bandwidth to make sure that there'll be no audio hiccups, etc. And uh, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat and we can go over them after the presentation is over. We have plenty of time, so thank you. Okay, let me just pull up this presentation. Uh, here it is. Are you seeing my screen? Hopefully, yes. We do. Okay. So, um, as I said, this is a high level architecture overview of the project and its main challenges. Um, first things first, um, this was uh, you know, the business challenge was uh, the fact that our client used a microservice based uh, application that uh, needed to be redeployed very frequently. Um, and uh, this uh, caused a great deal of hassle with all their redeployments because of the various bits and pieces which needed to be done manually. Um, and uh, they have started this application like a combination of uh, a platform as a service and software as a service approach, which means that sometimes they just sold this application for their clients for self-hosting. Uh, like a software package, and they weren't very uh, cloud focused mm -hmm. in this manner. This was supposed to run on pretty much uh, every type of infrastructure that it's thrown at. And right now they're transitioning to more of a software as a service style hosting uh, focused around uh, cloud provider, mainly GCP at this point, Google Cloud Platform. Um, so uh, when we picked up this project, we had a proof of concept environment built on Google Cloud. Um, and uh, the biggest challenge was that there were no, uh, no orchestration happening on the cloud provider level. And uh, it was just a matter of provisioning a number of uh, VMs and orchestrating them with the configuration management tools uh, like uh, salt, uh, quite a legacy one as well. And uh, we needed to have this uh, be brought in, let's say, up to date state according to modern standards in DevOps and best practices, well architected framework for the cloud provider, etc. So um, the customer uh, is the leader in. Um, uh, machine learning solutions for data analysis. Analysis. Uh, their main target audience is uh, enterprise, heavy enterprise in various uh, industry fields like uh, fintech, security, healthcare, and uh, other sectors where it's really a matter of uh, aggregating uh, huge amounts of data. Uh, by huge, I mean sometimes scalable to a petabyte. So 
this is uh, part of the challenge. Um, actually, the infrastructure that uh, hosts both the storage and the compute power for their application is super expensive, either on premise or on cloud. So any, any kind of opportunity for cutting costs was more than welcome. This was one of our main challenges there. Um, so uh, the other main challenge was the fact that they needed to uh, do stuff like patches and solutions, uh, solution plugins for their application in a rapid manner. Like they needed to have the opportunity to build the plugin today and have it deployed in production in one or two days at most, which back in the days was not possible. Um, the software itself I'm talking about, uh, again, I'm not able to dive into too much detail here, but uh, overall, this is a big data analysis application, which consists of a proprietary Java-based uh, uh, front end, which is used for uh, data ingestion and uh, displaying the various uh, visualization tools. Um, the actual legwork of the machine learning analysis is done in a Hadoop cluster. And the results and all the data trends and analysis is later done in an Elasticsearch cluster. Um, the, the front end is supported by a MySQL backend and pretty much all the stateful data that needs to be kept for regulatory purposes is kept in an object storage. In case of Google Cloud, this is the Google Cloud storage engine bucket, similar to S3 and AWS. Uh, overall, this is, this is a stack. Um, so again, about the main challenges that the plan wanted to solve was uh, the fact that there wasn't any automation on the cloud provider level, mostly due to the fact that uh, they wanted uh, to be vendor agnostic when it comes to hosting. They didn't want to be stuck with a given cloud provider. Um, the configuration management tool, the SALT server, uh, presented a security issue because it was on all the time and had root access pretty much everywhere in the estate. Uh, if they needed to have a temporarily compute power boost, they had no option to do it dynamically. All scaling needed to be done manually by provisioning more VMs and adding them to load balancers, etc. Um, additionally, due to the fact of the lack of automation on the cloud provider level, um, and all projects being uh, deployed uh, manually, there were various differences between uh, the project, um, which was not really acceptable. It was more, mostly related to the custom security requirements for every project. And of course, uh, hosting microservices on VMs is not very cost effective because of the overhead you, you're going for, for for the operating system and uh, all the different uh, provider uh, enforced tools that you need to host on their uh, cloud instances. So uh, these were the five main challenges which we were working on. Now let me just provide a brief uh, description about what immutable infrastructure is um, actually the way I see it. Uh, you're comparing having uh, a pet and having uh, a unit of cattle. When you're having a pet for a server, you need to patch it, you need to make sure that it's happy, you need to make sure it's not swapping RAM, etc. Well, if you have immutable infrastructure, you have uh, a bunch of uh, cattle that you can always uh, slaughter and bring new ones in if needed. Hopefully, you no know, vegans will get offended by this uh, uh, notion, but uh, this is how I picture it, at least in my head. So the idea is that uh, with this approach, we are not worrying about doing any kind of uh, security patching and infra infrastructure maintenance. 
this is the main focus of uh, this whole exercise. Um, now, a couple of uh, you know, uh, ideas why the client chose uh, GCP. It's, uh, uh, it was mostly price uh, focused, honestly. I think that they had a very good relationship with the vendor and they got pretty good quotes for their massive infrastructure needs. Additionally, um, our architects were able to map all the different features to the different offerings from Google Cloud pretty closely. So whatever can be used in a software as a service offering was used and the overhead of managing custom open source software for auxiliary purposes was kept to a minimum. And uh, additionally, Google Cloud offers uh, very good uh, baselines in their white papers for managing such a migration. Uh, it can be done in stages and it can be done in very non uh, disruptive way to put it uh, this way. Like you don't need to have too much of your development uh, resources working on the migration itself. Uh, the migration can be can happen in parallel to um, the actual software lifecycle progression. And I'm not saying that any of those features are not applicable for any of the other cloud uh, providers like Azure or AWS or uh, even pretty much everything else. But probably the main the main point here was the cost. Okay, now, why did the client chose SoftServe? Uh, as far as I uh, know, this was mostly related to the uh, great reputation of SoftServe of, uh, as a Google Cloud uh, partner and the uh, huge portfolio of similar projects already completed. And um, additionally, uh, the transition plan, as I said, was very non-disruptive to their standard operations. So it did not mean that, uh, okay, your software lifecycle needs to be kept to a halt for two months till we finish this. It was all done in parallel. And I think this was one of the main winning points for, for this uh, type of solution. Okay, so um, um, the actual solution was uh, um, dropped, uh, let's say divided into two main phases. Um, the first phase is connected to enforcing immutability on the VM layer without transitioning to any cloud native tools. Still, we want to make sure that uh, the practice of doing manual changes to servers and uh, patching them manually and installing anything on a pre-provisioned server is uh, put to uh, an end. So initially, we during the first phase, we were aiming in putting together a continuous integration pipeline that uh, manually, that, that we can use to manually deploy a given set of servers which host a given set of software. And after that, this whole stack is largely untouched. During the second phase, um, we are basically migrating the workloads to Google Kubernetes Engine. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, the two phases here very briefly again, and uh, all your questions are welcome after this presentation. So let me give you some background about uh, how was the solution looking when we uh, took it up. If we logically divide it into front end, middle tier, and back end, you see that uh, the front end is the um, Java application by the client, as well as some open source visualization tools used. Um, the middle tier consisted of uh, the Hadoop job, uh, job server, as well as the Elasticsearch uh, data aggregation tool. The backend was, uh, as I said, uh, object storage, 
uh, MySQL and the data cluster of Elastic. All those three were considered the uh, stateful parts of the application, and those are all here are, should be considered stateless to a great extent. Maybe the only exception was Tableau because it uh, cannot be installed in a very cloud native way. Again, those three here are uh, not proprietary. They can, they're uh, well known uh, machine learning tools. And if you want, you can load them up and see what they do. Not going to spend too much time on them. Um, whoever worked with Hadoop knows that uh, it relies on Kerberos ticketing system. So there was a Kerberos cluster associated with uh, assigning tickets to every role that spoke with uh, the Hadoop HDFS. And all this was uh, orchestrated with uh, SOAT style uh, management. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uh, very um, good for various reasons. And one of the biggest drawbacks was that the SOAT master server was required to be always on, which uh, resulted, of course, in a slight um, uh, security issue. Okay, so uh, what are we aiming with phase one? The first one was, of course, was to differentiate stateless and stateful services so that we can plan the migration accordingly. Um, I, I guess you're familiar with the cloud providers migration white papers. This is usually the very first thing they ask you to do when considering a migration. Um, of course, uh, there are various pieces of state here and there, which uh, are not very easy to like uh, simply divide. Uh, which is the next step, trying to um, get to a plan for migrating the state for applications. Uh, we also needed to uh, build, uh, build out tool that can uh, provision all the required network resources, network and security resources from a uh, cloud provider. We also were challenged with picking up a good security solution uh, to work with uh, this environment because uh, using an open source gem box as uh, for SSH tunneling and for other needs was not ideal. And respectively, we are supposed to put everything in a continuous integration pipeline. So, uh, the actual steps went. Uh, the first one was to build Terraform modules that uh, cover the VPC and the identity and access management accounts provisioning. It was pretty straightforward, no big challenges here. And the second one was uh, creating custom images with all the software we need. We have divided uh, all that uh, stacks in the previous diagrams in uh, different images. And we pre-built our images with uh, Packer and store them in a private uh, image repository with, with the vendor. And we use stuff like uh, latest uh, commit tags to differentiate between different uh, generations of uh, images. Um, of course, uh, when you need to parameterize uh, of such an environment, you need to come up with a naming convention for all the role uh, and uh, align it to the bigger picture. This is all uh, documented properly in a spreadsheet to avoid confusion. Um, the next uh, step was to build uh, Terraform modules to create servers from the images and uh, populate any configuration from a parameterized template. We were mostly using the building Terraform uh, population of uh, the startup scripts in Google Cloud to do so. Here and there, there were some custom uh, Jinja templates which were populated with uh, Python code, but it was mostly uh, left to the startup script to populate 
a given configuration template from the Terraform output on the corresponding module. Um, afterwards, um, uh, we are we have a Terraform module that um, creates all the different storage solutions. By storage solutions, I mean three things mostly. And those are the Google Cloud buckets, which contain the immutable objects. Those are the Cloud SQL databases, which are used as the application backend. And those are the persistent disks attached to some servers, which should uh, be considered stateful because we don't want to lose data on this um, application when we recycle the server. Uh, a good example for this is the uh, Elastic Data Cluster. We don't want to pull uh, the snapshot every time from the backup, which is in uh, Google Cloud uh, bucket. We would rather just uh, retain the file system from the previous deployment. Um, the other thing, this is a necessity that uh, came as the project progresses, it turned out that since we are not really able to get to an ideal um, immutable state, like uh, very often we needed to do changes on existing servers without actually redeploying them, but still this needed to be done in a secure fashion. We developed uh, Ansible uh, playbooks, which are executed on demand and uh, without having a master Ansible server. It works uh, when uh, Ansible is wrapped up in a Python application executed in a Cloud Run container. Uh, Cloud Run is the um, Google Cloud uh, equivalent, the, the Google Cloud uh, serverless uh, function executor, similar to Lambda in AWS. So it's used to build Ansible playbooks and demand and execute them on a particular clients without actually compromising the security on this. We have also um, utilized uh, these two prevex for um, zero uh, access, zero trust access policy enforcement. You can read about it. It's uh, a tool developed by SSH.com. It's proprietary, not uh, very cheap, but it does a very good job of keeping all the security policies aligned with uh, the business requirements. And it has, it, it offers very good visibility over the history of who did what in the targeted machines. So it's great for heavily regulated workloads like uh, fintech, uh, security, and um, other uh, other areas there. And eventually, we put all those uh, modules we uh, mentioned so far in Jenkins pipelines. So they that can be executed automatically or on demand. And this wraps up uh, phase one to a great extent. Let me show you the, the difference that we have according to the previous picture. It's very subtle, but to the very least, we have all the Google Cloud resources orchestrated with Terraform here. As you can see, we uh, don't go uh, in the console and provision uh, servers and resources manually now. It's all done via Terraform. Uh, TerraGrunt is used to wrap the Terraform modules um, so that we don't we are using uh, a root module structure. Um, for instance, uh, when we want to build uh, five elastic master nodes and five elastic uh, data nodes, we don't need to use uh, one and the same module uh, ten times. We'd rather have uh, Mm, we have a root module for Elastic, which has only a subsequent module for the master features and for the data features added into it. So Peregrine here is mostly used for ease of management of the modules. Besides that, we also incorporate the Prevex solution that allows for 
accountability of all the accessing that happened to every box. We also use the Google Secret Manager as uh, uh, Terraform outputs to, actually we're picking values from the Secret Manager to populate some values in the configuration files, such as database connection strings, uh, certificate pa uh, certificate uh, key store passwords, and anything like this we do by a, a secret manager to avoid having any uh, sensitive information residing on the code directly in the Terraform module <clears throat> source code. Uh, of course, uh, the Terraform state is kept on a Google Cloud bucket as well, with all the other um, long, long staying uh, information. And um, additionally, as I said, we have uh, created this uh, Ansible application that runs on App Engine. Now we have migrated from App Engine away to Cloud Run. Cloud Run is pretty much the same thing, but faster. So back in the days, this was uh, the picture of the application. Of course, everything is uh, being orchestrated with Jenkins as a pipeline. So we are on this uh, step here. Why do we need to go further? Um, uh, one of the main drivers to containerize this application was uh, a slight change to the software architecture of the application. Hadoop-based jobs are batch-based. And now the, uh, our client has some use cases for enforcing um, real-time uh, data streams for their data analysis tools. So uh, for the newer version of the application, they're replacing Hadoop with uh, another solution. This was a good, uh, Put uh, grounds for containerization because uh, if you don't, uh, if you self-host your Hadoop, how we did, it's not very, let's say, container friendly. So getting rid of Hadoop was the first, uh, um, the first sign that we need to containerize. Of course, we already mentioned that uh, having containers is usually cheaper than having virtual machines, and. Uh, of course, uh, when you're dealing with uh, containers in Kubernetes, uh, they're immutable by design. Uh, right now, with uh, container lifecycle policy enforced, uh, everybody knows that uh, when they go in a given container and change a given configuration file, that's probably going to last for only a few minutes before the container is recycled. So uh, this is the way to really uh, promote and enforce immutable infrastructure. Virtual machines uh, cannot really be considered immutable for various reasons. So what are the stages here in, in phase two? Uh, the first stage was adding a pilot service in a containerized uh, environment, which means rather than redeploying the whole application, We'll just add additional workloads to the existing application, make sure that it can talk network-wise with the existing services and try to process some workloads with it. And the second stage is uh, to implement a drop-in replacement architecture of the original one and uh, funnel some part of the traffic through it by means of manual changes to the front end load balancers and uh, process the workloads in parallel, both in the um, uh, containerized and the virtual machine uh, uh, environment. And stage three will be to eventually follow the traffic to the containerized uh, environment and decommission the old one. Now, see this, uh, this is something that happens on every Google project for every uh, customer of our customer. I cannot say that we have completely wrapped up stage three everywhere. It's a rather long uh, work working process that's going to maybe span for a few more months. Um, eventually, I can use this um, 
diagram to demonstrate uh, the first stage of phase two. So <clears throat> the additional workload mostly consists of an entry point, which is a replacement for those four uh, systems. The real-time data processing is done by Kafka. And um, the decision in Claire is again, something based on Elastic, but it's not uh, really an uh, Elastic search cluster. So uh, this is all happening in an individual Google Kubernetes engine notebook, and it's deployed by a, um, via Helm chart. Um, Prometheus is used for uh, monitoring of the solution and the actual management interface of this whole Google Kubernetes engine cluster is uh, happening through a virtual machine that we set up for this purpose, the Bastion server. It is uh, the only management endpoint available for this workload because the uh, environment itself is locked down to internal network only. The only ingress endpoints are uh, related to this uh, entry point, point here. Everything else is purely internal. So as you can see, this is uh, you can consider this to be a new feature to the original application. It works in parallel to this one. It's not disruptive of any means. You can go ahead and patch everything here by means of uh, building new Helm charts and applying it from the Bastion server. The Bastion server itself and Helm chart application is automated with uh, uh, various uh, tools, mostly Ansible focused. Um, after uh, stage two, this is what an environment in an ideal stage should look like. We are basically building two different node pools, an ephemeral node pool and a persistent node pool within the same cluster. The ephemeral notebook holds uh, the stateless resources and the persistent resources are held within, within the, the other notebook. Um, the main difference here is the uh, host node specs. They're, they're different for various reasons. For instance, uh, in here we don't provision much uh, very, very big uh, storage devices on the Kubernetes nodes because all the PVCs are actually hosted externally on a persistent disks out of the actual Kubernetes node. As well as uh, here the nodes are a bit more beefy with uh, more vCPUs and more RAM and here they're more lightweight because mostly they need to connect to the PVCs. This is the, the main goal here. Again, this whole thing is orchestrated with Helm. And um, there are a few items which are not containerizable at this point. I have uh, outlined them in green for various reasons. Um, for instance, uh, the SFTP solution uh, is something that uh, is, is, again, some proprietary Just give me one second, sorry. Okay, everything's back to normal. So um, the SFTP solution is not containerizable. They're using a proprietary uh, offering, which uh, the vendor is not uh, allowing it to be uh, put on a container yet. Similar to the situation with Tableau. Uh, Airflow itself is containerizable, but uh, uh, it's something that's yet to be developed. So it's a work in progress to make it uh, in a container as well. Um, all the storage resources offered by the cloud provider by design are not in a container, like the storage buckets, uh, the state of Terraform, the secret manager, those are all API access endpoints out of the cluster. This is why I have marked them in green as well. Pretty much everything is uh, created by either Kubernetes deployment. Uh, uh, apologies. Was there a question? 
Sağda sadece daha çok kabul. Okay. Yeah. Uh, never mind. So, um, um, that's it. Basically, it's a still work in progress. There are uh, various uh, bits and pieces that need to be still refined to make it uh, even more robust. Let's say that we have we've had the first environment which end up in this uh, phase only maybe one month ago. So there are yet uh, some things to uh, update and make better. But overall, this is how the environment looks. Let's talk about the, the main challenges that we uh, have here. Actually, what are the bottom line results? Well, the first thing is, as the original objective was to uh, create a blueprint for an environment which adheres to the well-architected framework principles in the Google Cloud Platform white paper. We have uh, used this as a framework to all, all the architecture decisions that were made so far. And additionally, we have used as many of the uh, Google Cloud provider products that we can to minimize the management overhead. Um, besides uh, the Google Kuber uh, Cloud Engine and the Kubernetes Engine, which is the which are the main building blocks, we are also relying on identity and access management for security uh, segregation between different uh, systems. We rely on the Secret Manager to hold uh, all the sensitive data. We rely on uh, Cloud Run to um, host our Ansible instance in a uh, masterless fashion. There are many more which I did not mention. Of course, uh, VPC, Firewall, Cloud DNS, uh, Cloud Load Balancer, uh, Cloud SQL for database management, all that bit are of course uh, added to the mix here. Um, the, the other objective, of course, is to uh, put everything in a, a CI CD pipeline, which can be used both for uh, creating new environments for new clients of our client, as well as for promoting changes to the existing solution rapidly based on automatic tests. Uh, given outcomes and uh, some sort of a pretty fine software development life cycle. Um, which are the main lessons learned? There are many, of course, this is a rather long and complex project, but uh, the biggest uh, and the most important things that I would like to mention here is um, that uh, no matter how hard we try to enforce immutability on uh, virtual machines, it cannot happen because uh, there will be always use cases and use cases that cannot really be neglected for somebody going in and making a manual change. Even if we lock them down and uh, disable SSH keys and uh, enforce uh, prevex only access, etc. There will be a situation in which uh, uh, urgent change of a configuration is required because it's causing an outage currently and somebody will go in there and do that change manually without adhering to the uh, procedure. So with the container, this is not really possible. You need to follow the Helm pipeline for any change. Of course, uh, this is uh, another obvious one and the stakeholder mindset. Uh, switching, especially from virtual machines to containers is a challenge for everyone involved. And bear in mind that uh, users of this application are various uh, people with uh, uh, business mindset. They're not only engineers. Some of them are not very um, technical to put it this way. and promoting uh, containers and making changes to 
simple files like uh, a YAML configuration via a change in a Helm chart is uh, sometimes painful. Everything needs to be very well documented and added to the accompanying documentation. And uh, there were lots of pushbacks here and there. Some of them were valid, some of them weren't really valid, but still we uh, spent a huge amount of time on uh, documenting and uh, clarifying all the changes that were happening over the past one year. Um, um, so when it comes to security, the best course of action is always to use uh, predefined uh, tools and products offered by your vendors. And in this case, uh, Prevex plus uh, identity and access management by uh, Google provider turned out that turned out to be a really good combination. We already underwent several audits for PCI compliance and uh, most of them uh, were really straightforward due to the inherited security offered by the vendor. So when you need to point out how service A and service B communicate, and you make sure that they communicate only using a service account offered by the cloud provider. You basically cross out various uh, various difficulties, like how are you going to rotate the password for this service account, or the API key, or the HMAC key, or the certificates, because the vendor takes care of that for you. And uh, comparing. Uh, those services come pretty much for free compared to the cost of the infrastructure and the network traffic that um, the client is paying to Google. So it's a shame not to use them, to put it this way. And uh, last but not least, of course, is uh, transition to container-based workloads is uh, something that's uh, very complex. Uh, whoever says that uh, a team of uh, DevOps uh, architects and a few engineers can lift and shift the workload in a container-based environment. Uh, this is a myth. It, it doesn't work like this. And the application needs to be heavily refactored. You can't rely on just uh, lifting and shifting anything and putting it in a container. It will, mm, I guess it really depends on the application. Something simple like a website might work. But the complex multi-layered architecture, it's really a matter of uh, uh, refactoring it and sometimes refactoring it very heavily to make it run in uh, a different architecture. And of course, this isn't, this is far from finished yet. We are yet to uh, implement more and more feature updates. Uh, we're yet to implement more uh, new functionality in our pipelines according to the client needs. And the bottom line is to make this cheaper, easier to manage, and very important, uh, of course, uh, completely immutable and secure. And I think uh, this wraps it up. Uh, hopefully you guys didn't get too bored and I'm ready for your questions.